Welcome back to our next edition of the CBB Review Studio Podcast. I am Dan Siegel, joined as always by my co-host Ben Anderson. Today we also have Matt Majinski joining the show, and we are going to discuss the transfer portal. We're going to go conference by conference, and in this episode we are doing the ACC. We're going to discuss our transfer portal winners in terms of teams, our losers, and we will make an all-transferred into the ACC, all-transfer top uh, starting five for that so before we get into our winners and losers ben i'll start with you and then i'll throw it to you matt thoughts on everything that's transpired pretty much in the offseason there's been a lot and specifically in the acc i i do feel like the top teams the winners that we're going to talk about are slightly underwhelming compared to the rest of the country in terms of conference by conference I don't think there's a a team that had an off season that totally wowed me where they both brought people back that may have gone to the draft and also brought in some high hot level transfers. So I I don't love this class for the ACC team uh for the ACC as a whole, but I do think there are some really solid players and I do think some teams help themselves out a lot as well. Yeah, I think that you know the ACC definitely like you mentioned it, it's not like the cream of the crop but teams have definitely gotten better. And I think a a theme that I noticed, I know this was throughout other conferences too, was players moving from one ACC team to another. Um, We could still see a couple more names as well that have other ACC teams in their final lists. And I just think that's kind of weird to me. You see it in the Big East a little bit too. Um, At this point, it just shows that nothing's off the table really. Well, yeah, in the Big East, we saw coaches go from one school to the other. So. College basketball is a crazy world right now. Let's get started. We are going to start. I'll give you my my winner that stands out to me in the ACC. That's going to be NC State. So NC State coming off of a pretty good season, definitely by the standards that they have set themselves over the last four to five years. This has been the best in that time frame. And they got a lot of transfers. That's kind of been Kevin Keats's staple and the reason that his 2022 to 2023 team was so much better than his past bunch of teams was because he was able to add and fill needs in the transfer portal and i think this team is reloaded and expected really to improve defensively i think that's the biggest thing that stood out to me because nc state was not a great defensive team last season but some of the players they got I mean, I think it starts with MJ Rice, the Kansas transfer, who I mean he's a he's a real NBA prospect who simply happened to play for Kansas. And it's hard to get playing time there. There's also DJ Horn from Arizona State, twelve, I believe more than twelve points per game in each of his previous three seasons, this past season being the best of the three. And he's a really good shooter, really good on ball defender. They got uh, Diara from Arizona State, who is a JUCO, who is the um, number two JUCO uh, recruit in the country, former Missouri Tiger, and Ben Middlebrooks also from Clemson. He didn't play too much, but also, an, like I said, a former top 150 recruit. He could stretch the floor as a shooter, and not to mention Jaden Taylor from Butler, who's Averaged about 13 points per game in his sophomore year. Also just a great on-ball defender. So they got some scores. They reloaded at some positional needs. But I think based on the look of this NC State transfer portal class and their key additions, their defense is what stands out to me. They got some players with some good defensive reputations and some good numbers. Yeah, absolutely. I agree. I like what they brought – in terms of versatility to the front court specifically, they did bring d- back DJ Burns. He's coming back for his extra year, yeah. which is important. But as we all know, DJ Burns has his limitations sometimes uh, with certain defensive schemes or, or players that he's matched up against. So having a versatile big like Middlebrooks or Diara, I think will really help the, the Wolf Pack out in the long run here in 2023. All right, Matt, go for it. Yeah, I, I think that Ben Middlebrooks is kind of like the sleeper there. I feel like he could be a guy that um, definitely, uh, you know, could help out this NC State team as well, Dan. So I do want to say that I, I like your pick there. I went with another in-state team, though, in North Carolina, 
Um, for me, it's more about who they lost. I don't think it's a big deal. Obviously, that starts with Caleb Love, a guy who I think is one of the top transfers in the portal, but he chooses to go to Michigan. I feel like his peak was two years ago when North Carolina made their run to the championship. It was pretty much the same team last year. Everyone knows the story. North Carolina is projected to go back to the Final Four. It seems like a lock. They're not able to. I don't think that it's all Caleb Love's fault, but I think that it's good for him to get a fresh start and for North Carolina to get a fresh start. And obviously that starts with Harrison Ingram, one of the best transfers in the entire portal, put up great numbers at Stanford. Now he moves across the country to the ACC, where I think he's going to be a very key player on this North Carolina team, a team that will still return talent. So it's not like they're going to rely on Harrison Ingram. You know, there's the chance that R.J. Davis could still be the number one guy. Who knows what Armando Baycott's going to do? So this is a UNC team that still has a lot of guys, but Ingram's going to be a big piece. Cormac Ryan and Jalen Withers, like I mentioned, guys that were pretty good at their other ACC schools. Now they transfer in. Um, and in the example of Ryan, it's a North Carolina team that loses Tyler Nickel, a guy that is supposed to be a really good shooter. You know, is he going to catch on on Virginia Tech? We'll see. But they get Cormac Ryan, a guy who's a proven scorer and that will help this Tar Heels team. And then Paxton Wojcik, who is obviously a very smart player coming from um, an Ivy League school in Brown, and another guy who can really light it up. And I think he is going to surprise some people because he's a playmaker too. Averaged over three assists per game with Brown last season. So I think you're going to see a North Carolina offense that won't rely on shot creators and instead is going to be a lot more efficient than they were last season. Yeah, I definitely agree on the fact that based on who came out and who's coming in, they will be changing their identity definitely for the better. But um, I don't, I don't know if they stood out to me as much in terms of their additions, but I do agree. Their subtractions were not really going to hurt them, especially with uh, Caleb love. That's definitely a mutually beneficial parting there. So I'm with you there. Yeah, absolutely. Um, as we move on into mine, I think that these three schools are the winners. Um, I don't think many people are going to pick one of these three schools outside of NC State, like Dan said, uh, North Carolina, like Matt said, and then my winner is going to be the Virginia Cavaliers. Not much of a homer here. I just think it's the best pick left after uh, Dan and Matt took the North Carolina schools in their picks. Uh, they picked up four main additions that you should be aware of from the transfer portal. They have Jordan Minor from Merrimack. He's a big, sort of in a Jaden Gardner mold, Gardner mold, where he had an extremely high usage rate at, at his old school. Um, that probably will get toned down, but it's nice to have that depth in the back court, in, in the front court after losing both Caden Shedrick and Francisco Caffro to the portal. Um, and then we also have Andrew Rohde, which I think is one of the most underrated pickups that any school has said had in the country. He did work at St. Thomas as a true freshman, averaged over 17 points a game, had a particularly nice end to the season where he hit 20, at least 20 points in his last six games, I believe. Really talented. He can he can fill it up. And he's a great big lead guard that uh, UVA can use, especially if it looks like uh, Reese Beekman is going to trend towards leaving and entering the NBA draft a year early. Um, and then the other two uh, guys here, Jacob Groves, if he can stay on um, as a shooter, he'll be a valuable piece coming off the bench. He has papering some size as well. And then finally, Dante Harris. Don't underestimate the amount of importance that being yeah. in the Virginia program is um, for, for a long period of time, just due to the fact that it does take time to learn the pack line defense. Dante Harris was a mid-year transfer. He redshirted this past season, uh, but he's been here since, I believe, December. So it's really a, a great fit, again, just to bring more depth into the backcourt as well. They do lose a lot. Virginia does um, from last year's team, but I do think these are important additions as well. Yeah, I think – is it Rody or Road? Do we have that confirmed? I believe it's Rody. Um, okay. I'm not positive. Okay. Um, that's definitely like the – biggest standout addition in terms of the rankings. I think Harris is a super underrated addition because if Reese Beekman is not there, which we're not sure about yet, if Reese Beekman is not there, ball handling is going to be absolutely critical for Virginia and Harris is going to be that primary ball handler. But 
we talked about the winners. Now it's time to talk about the losers of this year's cycle so far regarding the ACC and the transfer portal. And for me, it's got to be Florida State. Look, actually, this morning, Florida State did just pick up Primo <laughs> Spears from Georgetown in the transfer portal. So that's a pretty great addition. Ben talked about how it wasn't really a great Leonard Hamilton fit, Primo Spears to Florida State. But I think it just goes to show how desperate Florida State is just for bodies on their roster and talent and production, regardless of whether it is ideal for their system or not. And the reason that is is because of just how many people transferred out. And prior to Primo Spears, that was pretty much the only – transfer addition they had so let's talk about who left the florida state program which by the way they already had a terrible year last year nine and 23 seven and 13 in the acc then they lose caleb mills and then they lose matthew cleveland which now you just lost two of your leading scorers from a team that pretty much it was just them two i mean those two averaged each over 13 points per game you lose McLeod, who's a role center. Um, the other two guys, not significant contributors, but still, I mean, Florida State, if you – yes, Spears is a great addition, but if you measure on a balanced scale what they brought in versus what is left and also consider the fact that they needed a good offseason desperately, Florida State is definitely a loser in this year's cycle for me. Yeah, I think those are great points. I, I do struggle, and you're, when we get to my team, I'll talk about this as well. But, like, if it's if it was a bad team last year, how concerned are you with the fact that they lost the players from the bad team that made the bad team bad, right? But in Florida State's case, it was just the amount. And really, they don't have a ton coming and back that you're confident that, that you can say, hey, this man will stick out. I'm really confident in that. But I'll let Matt go on to his. Yeah, and uh, I picked um... – and Dan, I do want to say real quick, I do agree. I think Florida State, you know, I, I get your point there, Ben. Like, if you're a bad team already, is it really big losses? But, I mean, Caleb Mills was a great player when he came to Florida State originally. Matthew Cleveland's maybe a little bit of an NBA prospect. So it's certainly a Florida State team that had a little bit going for them. They just couldn't seem to put it all together as a team. I went with um, with Notre Dame. Um and again, kind of the same as Florida State, a team that struggled last season. So you could bring up that same point. Is it really, um, you know, is it really big losses? I will say this. You're losing Corm Cormac Ryan and J.J. Starling to teams in your conference. So that is not that is not great because you're going to have to go against Cormac Ryan, who was one of Notre Dame's best players last year, to be fair. The J.J. Starling loss is huge. I mean, he's one of the best transfers in the portal, in my opinion, based on his potential. He had a good freshman year, and now he's gone. So, really, Starling's probably Notre Dame's biggest loss because if he stays with them, he's probably their go-to guy next season, either 1A or 1B. Van Allen Lubin, another very underrated loss because he actually put up pretty solid numbers as a freshman, only about six points or so, but averaged close to five rebounds. So you figured that he might have been a much bigger piece going from a role player, maybe to even a starting like, you know, complete role next season. The other losses, not as big, but it's also about who Notre Dame didn't bring in. They only have one transfer coming in, and that's Julian Roper, a guy from Northwestern who played all right freshman year, didn't improve this year, had an ankle injury, which cost him a little bit, should be able to come back from that. It, sh it shouldn't be anything serious. But you've got to be able to replace your talent with some more. They weren't able to replace it with anything. So I worry if the Fighting Irish in year one of Micah Shrewsbury are going to be able to improve. Like that 11-21 and 21 mark might be what they see next year. I don't see it going much up in year one of their new coach. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. I, t I totally agree with that. And when you combine that with the fact that they're also losing Lashevsky and Goodwin and Marcus Hammond and, you know, all of these uh, stalwarts in the program yeah. due to Mike Bray retiring. It's just, man, he's starting from scratch here in, yeah. in, in South Bend. 
Like the one redeeming quality of Notre Dame is they had experience. They were old and I just don't see any redeeming qualities next year, but there's, there's, I guess a long off season ahead of us. It's just at this point, we're recording on April 30th. The vast majority of the transfer portal has already been depleted. Absolutely. And then for my, for my loser, I went not to rub salt in the wounds, of course, not to add insult to injury, but the Louisville Cardinals lost a lot. Right. And what I'm concerned about not, is not so much like these players in particular. I didn't expect L. Ellis to stick around. I didn't think he was going to transfer to Arkansas. I just thought he might go pro, but I wasn't expecting him to be in Louisville next year. I would have liked to see Kamari Lands hang out for a little bit, um, come back to Louisville. I think he has some potential there, even though he played great um, his freshman year. Roosevelt Wheeler, I think, uh, is going to be a good addition for, for VCU there. And then obviously Jalen Withers, you talked about this, Matt, in your winner section. He can shoot it. Um, and it's all, it always hurts to lose your uh, your player to a conf- an in-conference rival. But it's also about who they haven't brought in as well, um, sort of in the same role that you guys have been talking about here too. They have a pretty good recruiting class, but in terms of transfers, it's Sky Clark, who really flamed out in Minnesota, or uh, not Minnesota, excuse me, Illinois, um, left the program and then eventually came in to Louisville. That's not overly exciting to me if you're if you're taking in a guy that sort of left the program mid-year during his first year in the in in Champaign and then you bring in Danilo Yankovic um, who is a transfer from Miami that didn't do a ton uh, with the Hurricanes during his time there so not only are you losing players and the majority of your production from bad team like a real bad team right you are also not bringing in the type of talent at least from the transfer portal that you would expect Louisville to bring in, given Kenny Payne and Nolan Smith's uh, reputations as a recruiter, that's a little bit concerning going into his first offseason. Yeah. And it's it's like see, I, it's hard to dissect this Louisville situation because they went four and twenty-eight. So if you told me prior to the offseason that all of this would happen and they wouldn't bring in much, like I it doesn't surprise me at all because what is the appealing qualities of a coach who has never coached at this level before and then goes four and 28 in his first season. The fact that they're getting anything to be honest is if anything surprising to me, but I guess if you just purely look at the players, they definitely do belong in the losers column. I'm just saying this doesn't surprise me at all. The fact that they went four and 28 is much more significant in Kenny Payne's resume right now at Louisville. So yeah, those are, no, I, I agree with you. It's just, uh, you can't, again, you can't ignore the fact that they haven't brought no. anyone as well. That's fair. Zan Payne's coming back though. Yeah. <laughs> so those are our winners and losers, but we talked about, we, we opened this episode with the fact that there's a lot of, while a quantity of players coming into the ACC, it's not something that there's standout quality and there's not like top 10, top 15 transfers in the portal coming into the ACC, at least not a high, at least not a high number of those guys. So what we're going to do is we're each going to give our all transfer team of five players that just transferred into the ACC. And I feel like we could, all three of us have completely different lists. So this is going to be really interesting, but I'll start with mine. So if you guys know me by now for these kind of te- for these kind of like exercises, I like to create teams that could realistically actually fit on the court. So I went with, I could, I feel like the, the guard position is what the ACC recruited the best in the transfer portal, but I kind of went a little bit more balanced this time. So my first guy is going to be, a guy for, who went from Central Michigan to Wake Forest, Kevin Boopy Miller. Boopy is his nickname. I think that's what he normally goes by, but uh, 13.1 points per game in 2022. Then he got injured for 2023. But the thing is, the last two years, Wake has turned guys from the transfer portal into absolute studs, whether it was last year, Tyree Appleby, the year before, Alondis Williams. Can Miller be the next guy? It's a little bit of a different path. He went from a mid-major school to a 
um, power conference rather than just being mi- mildly productive at a power conference school. He's more heavily productive at a mid-major, so it's a little bit different, but that's an interesting trend to look at. There's uh, J.J. Starling, which Matt talked about, going from Notre Dame to Syracuse. I can't imagine he's not in your team, Matt. Just a legit NBA prospect, and he averaged double digits last year, so that's pretty significant. On my wings, I went with Andrew Rohde going from St. Thomas to UVA. Ben discussed him. I think it's huge to for UVA to not only have length in a guard position, but also somebody who could create the sh- their shot. That's going to be huge. MJ Rice, I'll put at my four, going from Kansas to NC State. I talked about him. Just the talent is off the charts there. And then maybe not the fifth best player, but just to – keep it so that it's a real product on the court. I went with the center, Jordan Minor, going also to UVA. Ben, you talked about him, and he is going to bring an element to UVA that they traditionally have, but haven't had the last couple seasons, and that is real rim protection, great shot blocker, um, somebody who could play that pack line defense. Caden Shedrick did fit all that, but he – also had a lot of flaws in his game and got to foul trouble a lot. I think Jordan Miller's a little bit stronger, and that'll be huge. Go ahead. So, man. yeah, I'll take it. Yeah, Dan. Also, that is that is a very uh, that's a very good team. We have a couple of overlaps, but um, I kind of went a combo of both. Like I tried to include some guards, wings, and big men. I don't know if this team would necessarily work or not. I also tried to go with who I thought were the top five. But to your point the top five was just tough for the ACC because I feel like there's not one guy who is by far the best transfer to the ACC. Um, but there are certainly a lot of guys who should help their teams um, in no specific order. Jordan minor. Um, I know you mentioned him, a guy who three straight years at Merrimack averaged double digits in points. He improved them every single year. He was the NEC defensive player of the year. So, you know, he's going to come into Virginia and know how to play in that system. A bit undersized at 6'8", but he's got some beef to him, so I don't think that will matter necessarily. And um, he's going to have a big year. I think I'd be surprised if he doesn't average at least 10 points and have a big impact um, for the Cavaliers next season. J.J. Starling, again, I don't need to talk too much about him. I mentioned him a little bit before, but certainly a guy that, if Judah Mintz stays, could be a very top backcourt in the ACC. And if Judah Mintz leaves, then Starling will just have the ball in his hands that much more to uh, take shots and to make plays. Harrison Ingram, another guy that I mentioned before for North Carolina, just an all around player from Stanford. You know, he can score the ball. He can certainly rebound the ball, but he can get the ball moving. And I think that's going to translate well to North Carolina. DJ Horn, um, a guy that started at Illinois state, went to Arizona state, didn't matter. Some guys, you know, they transfer from a mid-major to a power conference and it doesn't work out. Worked out great for him. And now I think it's going to work out even better as he moves on to the ACC. And then my sleeper here, which I feel like you guys are probably going to disagree with, is Sky Clark coming in to Louisville. Um, wildly inefficient at times with Illinois. Um, but the talent is there. And I'm just waiting to see if that talent translates I think everyone would agree that it's there. Like Sky Clark would not have been a highly rated recruit if he wasn't talented, but we didn't see it a lot freshman year at Illinois. Could we see it with Louisville? I'm not sure because obviously they don't have a great roster, so he might have to play hero ball a lot. But I feel like, you know, it's a guy that it could work out and and it might surprise some people. And that's my five. Yeah, and to round us out, I actually won't include Starling on my list just because you guys have talked about it. Um, So I'll go in two different directions. Actually, it's funny because, Dan, I used the exact same reasoning that you used for for Miller at Wake Forest, but I just applied it to Hunter Salas instead. I think he's actually going to be the the more important transfer for them, and I think he is more likely to fill that Alondis Williams, Tyree Appleby, type role, even though obviously Miller has a little bit more production at his previous school. But I do like that transfer a lot from Gonzaga to Wake Forest. So I'll add him there. Cormac Ryan, I think, is 
North Carolina's most important transfer, just from a shooting and, and skill need that the, the Tar Heels have. So I, I like him at the two spot here. Rody is my three. I think he's Virginia's most important transfer. He brings size to the wing that we uh, the Cavaliers have not necessarily had. Um, and I think he'll be a really good pairing with Ryan Dunn in particular. Um, and then for my four and five, I think I will go minor just because he is the best big man that any team has brought in um, and to the ACC. So he'll, he'll have an important role within the Cavaliers program, and I'll end it off with Muhammad Diara. I think that the versatility or the, the shot blocking and the rebounding and the ability to play some good minutes, NC State's not really going to need the scoring from, from Diara, I don't think, but having him there as a defensive stalwart is going to be really important for the Wolfpack success overall, especially if Burns get into foul trouble. So those are my five right there. All right. Well, that will do it for today's episode of the CBB Review Studio Podcast. This is the first part of what will be a six-part series where we'll go through each of the power conferences and talk about the winners, losers, and all conference transferred in teams. Please subscribe to our episode or please subscribe to our CB Review channel if you have not already, if you are watching on YouTube or listening on Spotify or Apple Podcasts or anywhere where you get your podcasts. Thanks for watching again. Thanks for listening and take care.